Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Maybe I'll take off the mask. So it's my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, colloquium, special colloquium speakers, Henri Orlan. Uh, many of you know Henri, but I will say just a few words about, about him, about his biography. So Henri graduated from Ecole Normale Supérieure in 76. And then he did his PhD at the COA at Taclay, the Commission of uh, Atomic Energy in France. And then he went on to, to become a, he was for a few years professor, a visiting professor at MIT, some other places. And then he came back to Saclay where he was uh, uh, associated with the uh, Theoretical Physics Institute. And he was also the head of the Institute for some years. And he's still there uh, even today. Uh, and we started by working on problem in uh, nuclear physics. Uh, as a result of that, uh, there was a book that he published together with John Nagele from MIT on the quantum many body problem, uh, a book that is uh, quite well known, a graduate textbook that is used by many. Uh, after that, he ventured into other fields of uh, disordered uh, system, in particular uh, statistical uh, physics, uh, working on condensed matter, soft condensed matter, polymer, electrolytes, uh, working on the spin glass problem. As you will see, this is very much related to the Nobel Prize of, of Parisi, and he, will talk, uh, and he will tell us more about that. Uh, and lately, he also co-authored another book in biophysics called Molecular Kinetics in Condensed Phases. Uh, Henri is, uh, was knighted by the French Legion of Honor, Chevalier de la Legion d'Honneur. And uh, he is, in particular, a, a very welcome visitor to our university. He, he was a, a Sackler scholar some years ago, and in the last decade, he's, he's coming here very frequently as a Sackler uh, special uh, professor, uh, Sackler professor on special appointment, and he comes regularly at least once a year, uh, leave aside the corona, but uh, he's a very frequent visitor. He knows many people uh, here, and we are very happy to have him here uh, to explain uh, maybe some of the most important work of Giorgio Parisi, who was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, earlier this month. Before I give the podium to Henri, I want to tell you something personal. I was myself a student at MIT in the late 70s, early 80s. And actually, Henri was my teacher. And uh, as you can see here, this is, I, I didn't look at my copy book for 40 years, but this is a course that Henri gave at MIT in the spring of 1982 on disordered system. This is my copy book. And as you can see on the, I cannot see from it, 28th of May, Henri was explaining us the Parisi solutions, the, sim the replica symmetry breaking of Parisi. And that was almost 40 years ago. So with that note, I would like to invite Henri. Henri, we have a tradition. This is a special colloquium. We have a tradition to give a small present. This is given by our Center of uh, Physics and Chemistry of uh, Biological yeah. System. Just a, you, you like to drink coffee, so this is just oh, a, yes. a cup. Wow. <laughs> and I will pass to you the mic. Yeah. Thanks a lot to David for this uh, very nice introduction. I'm, uh, a bit uh, shameful of uh, hear, hearing all these uh, ah yes hearing all these nice words and uh, hearing also that uh, we were together like uh, 40 a little bit over 40 years ago uh, so thank you for inviting me for this colloquium i want to thank also Roy for arranging everything uh, and to arrange the special authorization to come to Israel, because as you know, Israel will be open only tomorrow for triply vaccinated people. So, but I was uh, lucky enough to, to be able to come. So I will uh, 
give a talk about uh, the... Okay, so first of all, let me tell you that Parisi has been, in my opinion, one of the most prolific, creative, and uh, uh, physicists in the late 70s up to now. So you will see that uh, I will show you the, the range of, uh, of work that he has been doing. So, this, so he was awarded half of the Nobel Prize. He got the Wolf Prize this year. Um, I don't know if my transparency is, uh, is a bit uh, cut, but uh, anyway, so he got the Wolf Prize this year and as uh, many Wolf Prize winners, uh, he got also the Nobel Prize the same year. So half of the Nobel Prize and the prize, uh, the motivation is for the discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems from atomic to plan planetary scales. So I will come back to that and show you a little bit which of his work pertain to this uh, motivation. And he got it together with the two uh, physicists, uh, one German, uh, Klaus Hasselmann from Hamburg, and uh, Manabe from Princeton, and both of them for physical modeling of Earth's climate, quantifying variability and, reli and reliably predicting global warming. So, so this is a bit small, but it's just a small fraction of the of the papers published by Parisi. He has, a, as you can see. A, Okay, I don't remember how many papers, but a uh, tremendous number of papers. Uh, I think maybe 250 or 300, something like that. And uh, in fact, his most famous paper is uh, Asymptotic Freedom. It's the, Alta, the famous Altarelli-Parisi equation, which in fact is called the DGLAP, D-G-L-A-P. So it's a uh, Dokchitzer, Gribov, Lipatov, Altarelli, Parisi. And it's a work on the distribution of partons in, a deep, in deep inelastic uh, scattering. He's also extremely famous for the, uh, do I have uh, this? Ah, this is a pointer, right? Okay. So this is also a very, so this is a book. So this is a very famous work. It's the so-called Cardar Parisi Jiang. So KPZ equation for which is a, a, a nonlinear equation describing the growth of interfaces. And uh, it's uh, very, uh, a lot of work, really literally thousands of papers has been written, have been written both by physicists and mathematicians on this uh, equation. He has invented with Enzo Marinari simulated tempering, which is a, an alternative, which is an improvement on simulated annealing, which is a method to, to find ground states or to simulate systems at finite temperature when there are many barriers of all kinds of heights. So in fact, uh, this is one of the works which is quoted in his citation for the uh, for his Nobel Prize. It's uh, the paper Stochastic uh, Resonance in Climatic Change. And so he really was the one to develop the idea of stochastic resonance. So stochastic resonance is the phenomenon when you have a, a stochastic system which is driven by a periodic potential. If you add some white noise, the white noise has components on the, on the periodic uh, noise. And so it will enhance the signal of the periodic noise and eventually it can even make it resonate. And so this has uh, implications for global, for big changes in climate. And so this is uh, one of the things which is quoted in the, it's uh, from atomic to planetary scales. Uh, and so this, I think is the, the paper which uh, brought him fame in the statistical mechanics community and which I guess is responsible 
in most part for his Nobel Prize. It's the solution of the spin glass problem and the, the recognition that there is an infinite number of order parameters and the so-called replica symmetry breaking. So I will discuss a lot this part, the problem of spin, of spin glasses, because it's, uh, it has implication in all kinds of uh, other problems in physics, in mathematics, and in uh, all kinds of uh, biology, economics. Uh, he also wrote this uh, famous paper on uh, dimensional reduction. Uh, <clears throat> when you have a system in a random magnetic field, there is this uh, D to D minus two uh, thing on which uh, Amnon also worked quite a lot. And uh, he has been working on uh, real glasses, mean, but these are glasses in infinite dimension. There is a, and this is another paper on the interpretation of the spin glass, which is an important paper. Uh, this paper was important because I think it's the first paper which proposes to calculate hadronic masses using Monte Carlo calculation. And this started a whole industry on lattice calculations, and which is still uh, working uh, a, a big subject of research today. But it was uh, one of the first papers to propose to do numerical calculation, uh, st stochastic uh, Monte Carlo calculation uh, in QCD. And uh, this paper I quoted because I like it. It's on the use of the complex Langevin equation to to study systems uh, where the action is not uh, spe specifically real, but can be complex and it can be useful uh, in simulating quantum systems. Okay, so now uh, the outline of what I will talk about is the, I will do some review of the, of the spin glass problem. So to make the talk self-contained, I will explain a few things until I arrive two replicas, replica symmetry breaking and the Parisi solution, and the interpretation of the solution in terms of ultrametricity. So these are the two really important contributions of Parisi at that, in this problem. Um, okay. Doesn't work anymore. Okay, it's stuck. So this is the end of the talk, maybe? <laughs> solution my computer your computer you right? you broke my computer that's that can happen yes once in a while yeah not the first one yeah yeah okay <laughs> Why does it sometimes okay happen, so no? um that's a good question oh uh, no that's zoom which is doing that that's a new one for me. Interesting. I promise it's not prepared. <laughs> ah. Good. Thank you. Okay. So the first part is on the spin glass problem, and that's most of my talk will be devoted to the spin glass problem and explaining and showing the, the Parisi solution. Next, I will talk about some application of all these concepts to other problems, other applications. So in combinatorial optimization, protein folding, neural networks, and then I will conclude. Okay. So first, the spin glass problem. So this is really like the course I gave to David 40 years ago. So what is a spin glass? So it's spin glass, it's a, you have a metal, a non-magnetic metal like copper, and you put at random a certain uh, dilution of, uh, of uh, magnetic impurities. So it can be manganese, it can be uh, iron or whatever. Uh, you dilute them so in this and then you do some measurement on it so what you see is that there is no long range ordering of this so you have spins which are randomly uh, placed in your lattice 
And so there is no magnetization, no staggered magnetization, which means no antiferromagnetism. And if you look at the susceptibility of, the, of this alloy as a function of temperature, you see that there is a cusp, a singularity uh, at a certain temperature. And uh, depending if it's uh, field cooled or if it is uh, not field cooled, it's like this. And if you do the, the field cooled, it's, uh, there is a freezing like this. So there is no, so what is observed is a glassy behavior. There is no singularity in the specific heat. And there is a freezing of the dynamics below a certain temperature. And the freezing is displayed by this. These are the relaxation time of the system. You see that there is this divergence at this temperature. And the divergence follows a focal culture law, which is exponential uh, like this when T goes to T0. And this is the phase diagram that uh, physicists had, that experimentalists had been doing. So this is the temperature as a function of the concentration X of the alloy or the iron of the impurities. And you see that there is a phase, which is a paramagnetic phase, spin glass phase and ferromagnetic phase. Okay, so what are the interaction present in a, in a spin glass like this? So you have magnetic, uh, magnetic atoms interacting in the metal through the electron bands. So the magnetic uh, atoms polarize the electron band, which itself will polarize the other uh, electron, uh, the other impurity somewhere. So the interaction is of this type and it is called the RKKY interaction, Ruderman, Kittel, Kasuya, Yoshida. And typically it varies as a cosine two KF R minus R prime over R minus R prime cube. Uh, KF is the Fermi level of the underlying metal. And you see that this interaction is oscillating as a function of the distance. It decays quite slowly, but it is oscillating. So sometimes it is, uh, when it's positive, it's uh, ferromagnetic. And when it's negative, it's anti-ferromagnetic. And the fact that this interaction uh, is oscillating in sign uh, implies that there is some frustration in the system. So the notion of frustration was introduced by Gérard Toulouse. And the idea is the following. So the, the canonical example of frustration is the triangular lattice with antiferromagnetic couplings. So if you take a, a, triangular, a triangle with antiferromagnetic couplings, if you put the first spin here, for instance, you put it down, the second spin wants to be up to satisfy this. Then the third spin, you want to put it down to satisfy the antiferromagnetic link with two. But then if you put it down, this link is not happy. And if you put it up, this link is happy, but this one is not. So there is no way you can satisfy all the bonds at the same time. And this is the notion of frustration. So this frustration, you can see already at this level that because of frustration, you have uh, the, the ground state of this triangle is degenerate six times, I would say, because each spin can essentially be in two positions. You, you violate one of, the, one of the bonds and there are two ways to violate each bond and you, so you have six and the famous example of a frustrated system is the triangular Ising model in 2D. And if you look at the ground state of the 2D uh, antiferromagnetic 2D Ising model on a triangular lattice, it has a finite entropy at zero temperature, which is unusual if you take a ferromagnetic system or any normal system will have zero entropy at uh, zero temperature, but frustrated systems can have finite entropy. And in some sense, it's a, a small violation of the third principle of, uh, thermodynamics, of thermodynamics. Okay, so far from, uh, so the interaction is positive, negative. So in 75, Edwards and Anderson, so the famous Edwards and the famous Anderson proposed the uh, a model in which, instead of having the disorder in space, 
instead of having impurities which are uh, randomly distributed in space, the magnetic particles are on a regular lattice, but the interactions are random. So, the, and they use Ising spins instead of Heisenberg spins to make it simpler. So Ising spins are spin variables, which on each side of the lattice are plus or minus one. They use nearest neighbor interactions. So on a finite lattice, the Hamiltonian is minus J R R prime S R S R prime, where R and R prime are nearest neighbors. And the proposal of Edwards and Anderson is to take JRR prime, the interaction, as independent, identically distributed random variables. So for instance, the JRR primes can be discrete, <coughs> plus or minus J, they can be Gaussian, with expected average of J equals zero, average of JRR prime square equals J square. So this is the so-called Edwards-Anderson model. So then when you study a disordered system, the question is how do you do thermodynamics and what do you average? So there are two time scales in the problem. I hope you, <coughs> these are handmade drawings. Uh, so spins, the spins can thermalize quite easily. If you take a spin glass, the spins just flip back and forth. However, the position of the magnetic impurities are frozen. So what you want to do in the Edwards Anderson model, you want to have the J, the interactions to be frozen in their, uh, in their values. So the argument is that one should do the average free energies and not partition function. The average goes as, as follow. So if you have a large system of size L, you subdivide it in subsystems of, of size small l, so that small l should be much larger than psi, the correlation length inside the system. So this guarantees that each of these systems is essentially a macroscopic system. And uh, l should be much smaller than l, so that you have many of them here. So if you look at any extensive quantity, like the free energy, internal energy, entropy, we'll name it. If you assume that uh, L is much smaller than capital L, so the bulk energy or the bulk quantity in here is much smaller than the interaction, the surface energy or surface uh, interaction between two neighboring cells. And therefore, the total free energy of this kind of system is the sum over all cells of the free energy of all the subcells, all the small cells. Now, in each of these cells, you have a different representation of the disorder variables, of the impurities, etc. So, due to the central limit theorem, when you have this sum over all cells of F of X with I in a cell, so this, the central limit theorem tells you that this is just equal in the thermodynamic limit to the number of cells times the average of the free energy for a small cell, for a given cell, over all possible disorder. Okay, so the idea in the problem of uh, Edwards Anderson, what they propose is to take P as a Gaussian, so all the J, R, R prime are independent and drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And therefore, the quenched average tells you that the, you should calculate, in order to compute the free energy, you should calculate the expectation value of log Z. And this expectation value is calculated by doing the average of log Z for a given configuration over all uh, distributions of of uh, disordered links. So this is the prescription to do thermodynamics. You calculate the quenched average, which is the average of log Z. So the next question is how do you calculate the average of log Z? Because Z is a sum over some spin configuration it's inside the log and it's not very convenient. So you can do expansions and things like that, but Edwards and Anderson introduce and actually the first, I think, to introduce these replicas was Edwards in a paper 
uh, on entanglements in polymers, if I remember correctly. And, but in the paper of uh, Edwards Anderson, so they introduced these replicas and the replicas are based on a simple identity that uh, you learned in high school, that log Z is limit when N goes to infinity of Zn minus one over N, or you can view it as dZn by dN at N equals zero. So from this, you see that then you can do the average of this equation. So the average of log Z tells you that what you have to do is you have to calculate Z to the N expectation value, the average of Z to the N, and then take somehow the limit N going to zero. And if you can do that, you will have something to say about the problem. So the idea is to do the calculations at integer n, because of course, you will not be able to write z to the n for any non-integer n, and then to do an analytic continuation at n equals zero. Okay. So in Edwards Anderson, I, I will not review Edwards Anderson, just to give a few results that they use a variational method to compute the quenched free energy. The variational method is a, uh, just an extension of Feynman's uh, variational method where, where you uh, replace, a, you, you look when you have something which is quadratic. So in that case, it's quartic. You look for the best quadratic uh, form that will uh, represent your problem. So there is a variation of principle. What they find is that at any temperature, the magnetization is zero. So the problem doesn't have a magnetization, which makes sense because the, the JIJ are disordered. The, their expectation value is zero. But there is a spin glass phase at low temperature. And the spin glass phase is characterized by this quantity, which is called the Edwards Anderson order parameter which is one over N. So when I put brackets, brackets are thermal averages. So it's average over temperature. So it's average with a Boltzmann weight. And the bar is the average over disorder. So the Edwards Anderson parameter is one over N, sum over R, average SR to the square averaged. And this quantity in the high temperature, so there is a phase transition, and in the high temperature phase, this quantity is zero, and below it is non-zero. And one can show that this order parameter <coughs> is related to the autocorrelation function of the spins in the following way. <clears throat> so if you look at the correlation of S of T, SR of T at, at a certain point R of the spin, at time t and at time t plus tau. So if this quantity average over the whole, uh, over, over the whole lattice, you take the limit t going to infinity to be sure that your system is thermalized and you look at the correlation at a much larger time t plus tau. So usually if the system decorrelates, this quantity should go to zero. Now, if this quantity is non-zero, it means that the system has frozen into a state and this freezing transition is essentially the spin glass transition. So then uh, came this model, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And uh, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model is essentially a variant of the Edwards Anderson model, but on a complete graph, which means that all the spins interact with each other. So the matrix in a in the Edwards Anderson model, Jij is only between nearest neighbors. So only in any dimension, I and J will represent nearest neighbors. Here, all the, gra all, the, all the spins are in a complete graph and everybody interacts with everybody. Uh, because of this uh, interaction of everybody with everybody, in order to have extensivity in the system, in the distribution of disorder, of the disordered bonds, you need to do the proper scaling, which is that the average of Jij is zero, but J square should scale like one over N. So this is necessary in order to have extensivity in the system. And now you can compute Z to the N with integer N using replicas. So this is the average 
over the disorder distribution. <coughs> and then you just write n times the same partition function. So Jij, Sisj1, Jij, Sisjn. So it's really, you put them side by side. Now, P of Jij, let's say it's, it's a Gaussian. So you have a Gaussian here. You have a linear term in Jij here. So you can do the Gaussian integral. It's no problem. And you get an expression, which I wrote here. And you can trivially, essentially, the effect of the Gaussian integral is to square to have the exponential of beta square times this square. And this, uh, yes, and this square appears here. So this is an exact expression. You can get it very easily. Then you do, because this is quadratic, so you do the standard stratanovich herbert transformation by introducing a parameter QAB. And this QAB is going to be the central parameter of all the theory related to the edwards anderson parameter to uh, linearize this part and by doing so this is the final result that you get you get e so there is a prefactor which comes here and times this integral with the sum over a and b of q a b square minus log zeta where zeta is a partition function of these small n spins n going to zero interacting with this matrix q a b so QAB is an n by n matrix with n going to zero. And so now, so up to here, everything is exact. And you have this factor n here. So this factor n tells you that when n goes to infinity, this equation, this integral can be evaluated exactly by the mean field approximation. Mean field approximation means that you minimize this action with respect to QAB. So the minimization is fairly trivial. This term is QAB and this term will bring down as A as B. And therefore, oh, this is it. You get the mean field equation. The mean field equation is just that QAB is the average of SA as B, so two spins in the Hamiltonian QAB as A as B. So this is the equation to solve for general N and then take the limit N going to zero. So the free energy, the free energy is obtained as before, as we said before, as the limit of Zn minus one, etc. So when you do all the calculation, essentially what you have to do is to write the free energy is given by this, and you have to minimize this free energy with respect to QAB. If you do this minimization, you get this equation. But this is the expression of the, of the extremal free energy. So, first solution which was proposed by Sherrington and Kirkpatrick in 1975, I think, or 76, I don't remember. You say the replicas are somehow artificial, and there is nothing which allows to distinguish between themselves. So you may as well take QAB, the matrix QAB, as Q for any A and B. So uniform Q, because uh, it was just a trick to, to do the calculation, uh, which was introduced uh, before to somehow linearize the quadratic uh, expression here. So there is no real reason there is invariance uh, with the substitution you can the numbering of uh, of of the spins or of the q is totally irrelevant so it seems natural to take qab equals q if you do that you can calculate everything it's fairly simple and you get for instance an expression for zeta zeta which is the the partition function uh, this partition function, if QAB is constant, it's like a ferromagnetic, uh, a standard ferromagnetic uh, partition function. So you can calculate absolutely everything. You can calculate the limit of uh, one over N log zeta. By the way, you see that uh, when you take log zeta, you get this factor N. So one over N will give you this term. 
And when you take this, you just expand to first order in N. So the term one gives one. And then you have the term N log cosh. So when you divide by N, you get automatically this term. And as a result, the replica symmetry mean field equation is given by this. So this is what replaces the standard Curie Weiss equation, the equation M equals uh, tanh beta J M in uh, standard ferromagnets. And you can solve uh, this equation and look at it uh, in all possible ways. So this equation displays a certain, has a certain of uh, very nice properties. It has a phase transition at a certain temperature T, Tc equals J. So of course you could use beta J as a variable, but okay. So Tc equals J. For T larger than Tc, there is the solution is Q equals zero. And for Q, for T smaller than Tc, Q is non-zero. So you have the appearance of this uh, Edwards Anderson kind of order parameter. And when T goes to zero, when beta goes to infinity, Q goes to one. When you look at, now uh, you look at the, at the free energy as a function of uh, temperature, for instance, or things like that. So this is the phase diagram. In <laughs> fact, you can do exactly the same calculation by adding by assuming that Jij has a non-zero expectation value, you call it J0, then the phase diagram as a function of T versus J0 has this form with, uh, with the existence because of this J0, if you have <coughs> a, a ferromagnetic phase in addition. So essentially you have this spin glass phase at low temperature, paramagnetic, and then if you go for a large enough J0, you have first a ferromagnetic phase, which goes to paramagnetic. And you can have even first spin glass, ferromagnetic and paramagnetic. Okay, and the free energy looks like this as a function of temperature with a phase transition here. So there is nothing special happening here, but at lower temperature, what happens is that you find a negative entropy. You find a negative entropy and the free energy at zero temperature, which is found, which is it's just minus square root of two over pi, it's minus zero seven nine seven. And all the numerical simulations which were happening were giving minus zero point seven six three, which is significantly higher. And uh, and of course, in a, such a system, because you have dec discrete degrees of freedom, the entropy cannot be negative. The entropy has to be positive. So that's really a big problem that was, but the entropy is not so big. Uh, so people thought it's not a big problem, it can be. And, but then two years later, it was shown by the Almeida and Taules. If you, now, once you have, once you do mean field, you can look for fluctuations around mean field by writing that uh, the, your solution, by adding small fluctuations and expanding to second order looking at the eigenvalue of the Hessian matrix. This is what they did in 78. And they showed that as soon as you reach TC, the replica symmetric mean field, namely Q alpha beta equals Q, is unstable. There are unstable modes, and therefore the solution, it cannot be valid below TC. So of course, above TC, the solution is trivial because it's Q equals zero. Okay. So this is when uh, Parisi came in 79 and he proposed a different solution, which has the so-called uh, replica symmetry breaking. So the first solution is uh, the replica symmetry solution is, is given here. It's QAB, all the Qs are the same. You have an N by N matrix where all the Qs are the same. Then he proposed, and this idea was already uh, proposed by uh, André Blandin, a physicist from Orsay in France, one year before, to uh, make packets of, to, to uh, how do you say, <laughs> to cut the, the, to break the symmetry. And in uh, packs of size M1 by M1, so M1 should be a divider of N, so, 
we work with integer n, but remember that at the end we are going to take n equals zero. So the notion of divider is a bit. Uh, so the idea is that you make, you divide in packs of size m1, and the inner blocks, so the outer blocks you keep q0, and the inner blocks of size m1 by m1, you give a value q1. This is called the one step replica symmetry breaking. And it turns out to be exact for there is a very famous model uh, in disordered systems, which is called the random energy model by Derrida. And it turns out that when you formulate the Derrida model in terms of replicas, this one step replica symmetry breaking gives the exact solution of the Derrida model. But for spin glasses, it is not the case for the standard uh, Shankton Kirkpatrick model. Once you have done this, you have to do, so Paris is suggested to go beyond. So each of the Q1, if on each of these blocks of size M1 by M1, you redivide in blocks of size M2, where M2 is a divider of M1, and the outside you leave as Q1, and the inside you define a new parameter Q2. Again. <laughs> ah, he's a magician. So eventually you iterate the process. So you have Q0 outside, and then you, you make blocks like this with Q1. And then each block Q1 you break in two, and Q2 etc. And you do that with no end. So you have a, sec a sequence of integers n larger than m1, larger than m2, larger, etc. up to, so let's say you do it r steps, r times. So you do it r times. So you have this uh, sequence of integers. And for each of these blocks, you have a order parameter q0, q1, q2, qr. q is, is, is a constant within each block. So when r goes to infinity you and n goes to zero, so first you take r to infinity, so you, which means that you have a, a sequence of many, many q's and of many, many m's, and then you take n going to zero. So when you take n to zero, you have to revert this inequality. So this inequality, which was one smaller than etc., becomes zero smaller than m1, m2, etc., mr. So all these steps, of course, are extremely non-rigorous, and there was a lot of criticism in the in the <coughs> against the paper of Parisi when it came out, uh, not uh, the, because people didn't understand why it should work. All this kind of uh, uh, operation looked a little bit like magic. So when you do this, in the end, you end up with a mk, which becomes a, a parameter which runs from zero to one, so it's called x. mk goes to x between zero and one, and qk, the order parameter associated, becomes a q of x, where x becomes a, is inside zero one. So you have this uh, hierarchical structure, which embeds a certain order parameter Q of X. And the order parameter is a function, a function of the parameter X in zero one. And uh, one has to understand now what, what is the meaning of all this. <clears throat> I need uh, my assistant. <laughs> How do you do? Oh, okay, okay. This time I saw what you did. Okay, so <clears throat> if you if you recall the free energy in terms of the original matrix has this uh, simple form with the uh, sum of the Q alpha beta and beta, and then you can re-express all these quantities in terms of the order parameter Q of X. So for instance, if you take this term, and if you do all the operations, so we have to calculate one over n, sum over a and b of q a, b square. 
if you write it in terms of these uh, parameters m, uh, which are here, and the q, uh, you have, it takes this form, and in the limit when r goes to infinity, this becomes just the integral from 0 to 1 of integral of q square of x dx. So, for instance, the internal energy takes this form, <coughs> and the susceptibility takes this form. Everything can be expressed in terms of q of x, the Parisi order parameter. Now, uh, there is an equation. So, of course, the difficulty is to express this log of zeta uh, in terms of this function q of x. And in order to do the, that, Parisi showed that the free energy per, per spin can be written like this. So this term is just uh, this one. And all the other terms are related to this uh, partition function. And this function f of 0 and h has to be taken at h equals 0. And it satisfies this equation, which is called the Parisi equation. So it's a partial differential equation, which defines this part of the free energy as a function of q. And the boundary conditions are, are here. So in other words, you have a complicated uh, partial differential equation satisfied by f and then once you have it you have so if you could sat, if you could solve this equation you will have f average free energy as a function of q of x but then you have to minimize this free energy with respect to q of x given that this part is given by this so it's a bit complicated but it was done <coughs> so when you do this minimization you find the following results that there is a spin glass transition at still at the correct temperature tc equals j where the order parameter q of x is zero above tc for low enough temperature so when t becomes smaller than tc you have a non-zero order parameter and q is has a maximum so this is the function q as a function of x in the vicinity just below TC. So there is a maximum and it can be shown that the so-called Edwards Anderson order parameter is the maximum of the function Q of X. It, and the shape at low temperature is like this, that's Q as a function of X at low T and the maximum here is almost equal to one as you expect at low temperature. So what can be shown is that the entropy remains positive at all temperatures when you do the full replica symmetry breaking, the infinite set of replica symmetry breaking, and the analytic result is exactly the same as the, as the simulations were giving. So people were puzzled because the mathematics was extremely tricky, extremely non-rigorous in some sense, and so some people were doubtful and, uh, and uh, some people were criticizing the theory, say they didn't believe in it, but it was extremely amazing that the theory gave positive entropy and the free energy was absolutely correct. Uh, five years later, it was shown that the solution is stable at all temperature by uh, De Dominicis and Condor. And then it, the solution was proven to be exact by a mathematician, Michel Taladran, in 2006. He, uh, he's a probabilist and he showed that the Parisi equation is exact and the Parisi solution is the exact solution to the spin glass uh, Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. <clears throat> uh, I can add that uh, I remember precisely at MIT, there was once a seminar by uh, Phil Anderson, and uh, some people asked him, uh, so that was in 81 or 82, so it was really the beginning of the Parisi solution, and people asked him <laughs> if he believed that the Parisi solution was correct, and he said, of course, it's correct. <laughs> so he was absolutely convinced that it was correct, although uh, it was very difficult to prove. Okay, so, then the question is, the, what is the physical interpretation of the Parisi replica symmetry breaking? 
So, first of all, it was noted that below TC, so once you go in the spin glass phase, there is an ex exponentially large number of pure states. So valleys of the free energy, whatever, however you define it. In fact, uh, you define it by writing some, uh, uh, some uh, mean field like equations and solving them and you count the number of solutions. And uh, this work was done in 1980. And it was shown that the total number of pure states is exponentially large. And all the phases, all these states are not related by symmetry. There is no, you know, it's not like uh, if you have a <coughs> Heisenberg uh, model where you have a, a degeneracy of the, of the <coughs> ground state and the degeneracy is just the symmetry of the, of the sphere. But here there is no, at least no known symmetry. Uh, it was shown that the extensive part of the free energy of these valleys are degenerate, so, and they differ only by non, by non extensive parts. And these, uh, these valleys are separated by high barriers. The barriers are not uh, extensive, but they, are, they scale with n. And this is why you have a freezing transition, because of course, once you have high barriers and the system um, is stuck in one of the states, uh, the system is frozen. And the point is that the structure of the complex of this very complex phase space is characterized by the distribution of overlap between the pure states. So I will explain a little bit what that means. So Parisi suggested to calculate, so you take two replicas of the same system and you calculate what is the, so these two systems, are each one of them are in two different valleys and you calculate what is the overlap of these. So the overlap is, the, is defined like this, right? So one of the system is, a, is in a spin configuration SI1, one is in SI2, and you average over all configurations of the system. So this gives you the distribution function of these overlaps, P of Q. So Parisi showed in 1984 that P of Q is related to this Q of X by this relation that P of Q is DQ by DX. So if you have no replica symmetry breaking, P of Q would be just a delta of Q minus Q EA, just one order parameter, which means that the distribution P of Q would have a single peak. Now, if you have replica symmetry breaking, the P of Q is non-trivial, it's a continuous function. And it describes, so it's a measure of the distribution of the overlap between all the valleys in the system. So for instance, around TC, if you take the, sorry, the Q of X, um, no, which was like this, from this, you can see that the P of Q is one, is, is DX by DQ. So you get this result. So this is the probability to have a certain overlap. The overlap, maximum overlap is QM. There is no two states at this temperature which have overlap larger than QM. And you have a distribution of possible overlaps which are given here. And at H, at a very low temperature, uh, the picture looks like this. And <clears throat> Finally, they showed also in an important paper that the, the phase space of the spin glass is ultrametric. So that means that if you calculate, if you take three states now, one, two, three, with overlap Q, Q prime, Q second, you, if when you calculate, so you can calculate this quantity P of Q, Q prime, Q second with the Parisi solution, like you could calculate P of Q, Right? If you have two systems, you have only P of Q. If you have three systems, you have three overlaps. And what you show is that when you calculate this P of Q, Q prime, Q second, you ne necessarily you have a, fun a delta function of two of the Qs out of the three, which means that two of the Qs are necessarily equal, which means that you have an isocellus triangle and with a short base. And these spaces have been studied a lot in mathematics, it's called ultrametric space. It's related to some uh, number theory 
things which are called periodic numbers. And this is characteristic of a tree like this. And uh, so these are the final uh, valleys. And when you go, so this is the, all the, all the states, for instance, in this branch have an overlap, which is, uh, which is, so the distance between these two states is shorter than the distance of any of these states with any other states in the, in the system, etc. You can, so this is a really uh, ultrametric tree. And this structure can be reformulated like this. So what it does is it has, a, it implies a lack of ergodicity in the system because of course when you want to make a transition for instance from one state to here you have to go up and up and so you have to to cross a lot of barriers before you can fall down back to the state uh, where you look your transition <clears throat> and uh, so the dynamics on these ultrametric uh, trees has been studied a little bit later and they show of course uh, stretched exponential uh, decay of the dynamics. So, so far for, so far for the spin glass case. So how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> so I will, uh, I think I will finish on the combinatorial optimization because, so, uh, so combinatorial optimization is uh, very important uh, in many fields in uh, industry, computer science, economy, biology. And the typical problem is a traveling salesman problem where you have n point and n minus one over two distances between the points. And you look for the path, the shortest path, which goes to each point once and only once. So the problem is NP complete, which means that there is no known algorithm which can solve exactly the problem in a polynomial time. And so uh, the problem, instead of looking for the shortest path, uh, it was suggested by Vanimenus and Mesa in 1984 to look at the problem at finite temperature. And it started a whole uh, lot of, uh, <coughs> of uh, study of, uh, optim uh, of combinatorial optimization uh, at finite temperature and you can reformulate the problem as a so you can look at the random problem when the distances or when the points are random in space and uh, there has been studies inspired by this uh, spin glass uh, theory on this problem there is another problem which attracted a lot of uh, of uh, attention which is the assignment problem so the assignment problem was introduced or it's called also the bipartite matching problem. It's a problem which was introduced by a French mathematician Monge in 1781. So he, he introduced it uh, uh, for factories looking for ore. It's uh, related to a problem called optimal transport. But since I live in Paris, I make it with uh, bakeries and bakeries and flour. So bakeries need flour to make baguette. That's uh, well known. And croissant and pain au chocolat. And so if you have some bakeries in Paris, they need to, to get some, some flour. And uh, so on the other hand, you have meals around Paris, which are here, and the meals produce the flour that you need. So then uh, there is a transportation cost for for instance, for bringing from meal A to, to bakery four, there is a certain cost. There is a cost to one, to two, etc. So you have a matrix of cost from each meal to each bakery. So these are the meals and these are the bakeries. So the question is, what is the transportation plan which will give you the optimal cost for transporting the quantity of flour to each of the bakeries. And of course, so in this case, it's uh, simple. And so A goes to one, B to two, D to three, etc. And uh, this problem 
the question is how to minimize the total transportation cost. And it has tremendous applications in many different domains. And this problem is also called the marriage problem because it's, uh, it's the matrimonial agency problem where you have a, a certain set of individuals here, here and you put weights uh, between the two. So the weight <coughs> is not a distance in that case. It can be, it's a fitness somehow. And the question is, how do you minimize this quantity? So an assignment is just a permutation of the other side and the matrix, you have a matrix, uh, cost matrix, which is positive. How do you do that? So the problem, if you solve it exactly, it's polynomial in N cube. It's the so-called Hungarian algorithm. So you can calculate, you can calculate the partition function. If you assume random costs, you can perform quenched averages and that was done in 85. And you have infinite number of order parameters again, even without replica symmetry breaking. And what a quite amazing result is that if the distribution of cost is exponential, the minimal cost can be calculated exactly. It was done by Mesa and Parisi <coughs> using all these techniques. And it's equal to P square over, pi square over two. And it was proven rigorously 15 years after by a mathematician from Berkeley, Aldous, who is a very famous prob probabilist. Mesar and Parisi also uh, using this kind of uh, random disorder system, replicas, or another <coughs> technique, which is called the cavity method. They sold, they found the analytic solution for the random satisfiability problems. Okay, I think my time is maybe over. So I will skip all the rest. And I come to the conclusions and okay. The conclusion is that uh, when uh, Parisi saw the spin, okay. So when Sherrington and Kirkpatrick introduced the SK model, the spin gas model, they thought that uh, they had solved it basically and that it was very, and that the physics was fairly simple, that, it was a phase transition, uh, ordinary phase transition, but Parisi showed that it was a totally different kind of transition where you have an infinite number of phases in the system which are unrelated by symmetry. And in that case, the order parameter does not represent any individual state, but it is the overlap between the distribution of overlap between the various states. These states are organized in an ultrametric organization so it's a kind of hierarchical organization and this of course has a great uh, <clears throat> impact on uh, dynamics on ergodicity and things like that so this uh, concept of uh, replica symmetry breaking a quenched average a disordered system have had a tremendous uh, impact in domains such as optimization biology neural networks all these uh, subjects on which I didn't have time to, to speak. And although uh, there have been enormous achievements by Parisi and his collaborators in this system, there are several remaining challenges. One is the description of spin glasses in three dimensions, <coughs> because the spin glass in the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, the model is uh, totally connected. So totally connected is equivalent to infinite dimension. And uh, there is no satisfactory theory of the spin glass theory in three dimensions. And also related to spin glasses, there is a problem of structural glasses, the standard glasses in which you drink or the others. And there is no real satisfactory uh, physics explanation of the physics of the structural glasses in three dimensions. But still uh, the work of Parisi has been quite amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henri. Uh, time for a few questions, although yes, late, but, uh, maybe I'm not. Uh, oh. The last sentence. 
you said three dimensions. Is there any such solution in two dimensions, in one dimension? Uh, so in one dimension, uh, I think in one dimension it's not so complicated, right? The <coughs> in one D the spin glass problem is trivial. Yeah, no, for, for I'm not sure. Uh, no, but no, you can just. Uh, no, I think you it think is. Think about nearest neighbor. Nearest neighbor, neighbor yes. Ah, uh, no, no. Be. But I'm talking about nearest neighbor because yeah, you can just gauge out the the J. The, uh, but if you, if you have two, I'm sure that you can by putting it using different transfer matrices and things like that. Uh, I, actually, uh, uh, on a ladder, it can be solved. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's this product of uh, random two by two matrices, which have this chaotic uh, behavior <coughs> and uh, which have been studied by Keston. And uh, <coughs> there is a whole literature on, on this, uh, on this two by two, on ladders with the, uh, yeah. Yes? Is it absolutely clear that if you go to higher dimension, Problem becomes more and more difficult. Maybe in, in the limits of very high dimensionality, maybe it becomes. Is it possible that it will become simpler? In high dimensions, yeah. so so this is the picture in high dimension. The the mean field is a picture in high dimension, right? So the question is if it becomes simpler in lower dimension. And uh, so you know there is this is alternative. Still the high, the, uh, that's the dimension? that's the upper critical dimension is a. Uh, Suspected to be six. Suspected, but has it been proven for the Paris distribution? Uh, I think it was proven by the Dominicis again, but uh, okay, I would not uh, swear it. I but I think uh, six is accepted as a. But of course, uh, some people are trying to show that even below six, the Parisi replica symmetry breaking scheme is is still the same, which is not uh, not clear. First one? No. Thank you again on this one.